we are glad to have you with us this morning. Let's all stand. We'll start with majesty this morning. Majesty, worship his majesty. Unto Jesus be all glory, honor, and praise. Majesty, kingdom authority, flow from his throne unto his own, his anthem raise. So exalt, lift up on high the name of Jesus. Us. Magnify, come glorify Christ Jesus the King. Majesty, worship his majesty. Jesus who died, now glorified, King of all kings. So exalt, here we go. So exalt, lift up on high the name of Jesus. Magnify, come glorify Christ Jesus the King. Majesty, worship his majesty. Jesus who died, now glorified, King of all kings. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. My, my, my. So good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Happy Father's Day to all of you fathers. So good to see all of you here today. Everybody else, you glad you're here? Amen. What about fathers? Y'all glad you're here? Amen. Everybody, you glad you're here? Hallelujah. It's a good place to be on Sunday, Father's Day, be here in the house of the Lord. Thank God for dads. Amen. Godly dads anyway. I thank God for you being here today on the house, uh, on this beautiful Sunday in the house of the Lord. What a day to celebrate Father's Day and what a great day to be here in the house of the Lord on Father's Day. And uh, we're going to be saying some more about Father's Day in a few moments. But, boy, we had a great brotherhood this morning. Got to hear my son speak this morning. Boy, he done an awesome job. I'm telling you, I wish all of you men could have been there. And, uh, of course, a few women would have been there. It would have been all right, too, I guess, if we'd have invited you. That's what brotherhood's about for men. Boy, he, of course, he nailed us. He nailed us this morning, didn't he? Yeah, he got us down this morning. Y'all women probably would have appreciated that as much as us men did. It was real good. But I'm glad to be here and glad y'all are here. If y'all wonder what this glow is up here in the, in, in, the, in the choir, we got a little extra glow up here. It's these new grandparents we got up here. Uh, Tim and Wanda, boy, new grandparents, and we're celebrating with them. Sydney and Connor has got that new baby girl, and boy, we're excited for them. And thank God for uh, all of his goodness and new birth, I'm telling you. And they're celebrating, and Tim and Earl, Tim Earl and Wanda celebrating, and we're all celebrating, just thanking God. I'm telling you for this new baby girl. What a beautiful doll. She's, I've been watching the pictures on Facebook. I look at Wanda because she's posting them now. I'm telling you, she's proud. I don't blame her. And that's a beautiful girl. She gets it honest, all these pretty girls, and thank God for them. And, uh, of course, we're grateful and thankful for God's blessing on their lives. I'm so glad uh, we have so much to be thankful for. We do, don't we? Yes, sir. Anybody here don't have something to praise God for? You don't have anything to praise God for? If you'll, if you'll let me know, just raise your hand. I'll see if I'm happy with that because you got something to praise God for, and I'm glad you're here in the house of the Lord to do it. Amen. Well, we won't be here in person tonight. Father's Day, Mother's Day, we usually take off and spend it with the family, so no in-person service tonight. The online service will be on tonight, of course, for all those who uh, normally join us online, and, of course, it will be last Sunday night service. If you missed that, you'll need to get online and see it for sure. And it was great, man. We had a marvelous time right here last Sunday night. So don't miss that. And then, of course, uh, don't forget Wednesday night. 
uh, coming up Wednesday night. We're looking at the real problems in a real world and how God solves them with real examples from his word on Wednesday nights. I trust you're catching that online if you're not here in person. And boy's helping me with this past week. We looked at bitterness. How do you deal with bitterness? God shows us a real good example of how to deal with bitterness. Not just talk about it, but how to deal with it. And uh, God shows us examples of that. And then, of course, next Sunday. Next Sunday is uh, Vacation Bible School Sunday. We're going to invite all of our kids back and invite the parents to come with them. And right after the service, we'll be eating and uh, just having the slideshow. Sister Jennifer and Sister Kristen will be talking about what we did in Vacation Bible School. And then also, I didn't bring her picture. I meant to put it in the slideshow. Sister Francisca Ambrosia, I think it's her last. I can't pronounce those names. I, I'm just an old city country uh, country boy. I'm not a city boy, and I, I didn't. But she's a beautiful lady from uh, Philippines. She's a third generation missionary from the Philippines. She'll be coming here talking about what God is doing in her life, and then we'll be doing our vacation Bible school slideshow as well next Sunday. You won't want to miss it. I'm telling you, you're going to be in for a good, good time and a good, good service. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful and thankful for the privilege to be in your house today. Thank you, Lord, for Father's Day. And thank you, Lord, that you are the Father that we can always depend upon. Lord, I realize everybody don't have a dad on this earth like I had. And I realize, Lord, uh, many of us are striving to be better dads, better fathers to our children and grandchildren. Lord, I'm glad you can make a difference in our lives to do that. I want to thank you, Lord, for the privilege to do that, to be an influence on somebody else's lives. Lord, even men that don't have biological children can be a father influence, and I thank you, Lord, for that. And I thank you for the privilege to set aside a day that we call Father's Day to reflect upon the importance of dads in our lives and how important you are, Heavenly Father, to be our Heavenly Father that we can always turn to. As the psalmist said, Lord, even if the world, mother and father forsake me, Lord, I'm glad you'll take us up. You'll take us in, Lord. You'll take care of us. I'm glad you are that God that does that. Help us today as we worship you. Help us to put everything else aside and just glorify your name for being the God that you are, the heavenly father that you are. We'll praise you for all you do in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. All right, Brother Daniel, come on.
stand as the choir comes down this morning.
wonderful. Praise the Lord. All right. Sister Karen's going to come and make our presentation for our Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to all of our dads. Amen. So grateful. So grateful for all of our fathers. What an awesome responsibility and what a great opportunity to be a dad. Amen. Well, happy Father's Day to all of our dads. We couldn't make it without y'all. And I know y'all don't get enough credit for all that you do, but um, we really love each one of you and appreciate you. So we're going to start with our youngest dad. Um, <laughs> it won't be you. <laughs> um, do we have anybody that's under 20 how about under 25 how about under <laughs> how about under 30 Dad's under 30 right okay you're 30 Ryan okay 30. is anybody else 30 okay <laughs> That might count for two. <laughs> Come on, brother. Amen. Yes, sir. Reed. Happy Father's Day, Brother Ryan. Amen. Wonderful. Wonderful. Let me take some pictures. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and then we'll do the dad with the most children. So. <laughs> Um, does anybody have more than six children? Has anybody have five children? Uh, right. Okay. Okay, and then we'll recognize our oldest dad. Um, do we have anybody over 85? Anybody over 80? Do I feel over it? No. <laughs> that don't count. <laughs> um, okay. How about anybody over 75? I was going to give one for the best looking dad, but I was afraid we'd have a fight, you know. So, <laughs> so we'll just pass on that one. But um, happy Father's Day to all of you dads. And um, we love you and hope that we can all show you how much we love you today on Father's Day. I don't think we need to do the best looking dad. Uh, okay, we have a lot of men with some pretty big egos in here. We don't need to uh, go down the... And brother, five children, congratulations and bless you. Bless you. <laughs> Whew. I got three. I got three and I'm maxed out. <laughs> maxed out. All right. I'm going to sing His Mercy is More this morning. Stronger than 
than darkness knew every morn our sins they are many his mercy is more what patience would wait as we constantly run what father so tender is calling us home he welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. the payment his life was the cost we stood neath the dead we could never afford our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the Lord his mercy Thank you for that good song. Amen. Our children are headed to Children's Church. Thank you, Sister Ann, for all of them and uh, for what she does with them each Sunday. Amen. Wonderful song. Wonderful uh, thought. I wanted to preach on that this morning. Luke's Gospel, chapter number 15. It's where I wanted to look at and think about the mercy of the father, the prodigal's father. But this morning we're going to be in Proverbs. Proverbs chapter number 20. One of the smartest men, the wisest man, the Bible calls him, before the Lord Jesus ever walked upon this earth, the wisest man that was on this earth put together the Proverbs, wrote and put together the Proverbs that we have in the book of Proverbs in our Bible. And from it, of course, I believe under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uh, God used him, this mighty man of God, Solomon. And in the latter years, he got away, but then he come back. You can read his story, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs of Song of Solomon, as the Bible talks about it and calls it. If you're able and can stand with me, I want to read just two verses in this proverb, Proverb chapter 20, Proverbs chapter number 20. I call your attention to verse 6 and verse 7. There's much we could say here in this whole Proverbs. Proverbs is filled with so much wisdom. Uh, I had a man uh, tell me many years ago, and I've strived to do it. I haven't always been faithful to it, but I've strived to do it. Read a chapter in the book of Proverbs every day of your life. Today is the 19th day of the month, so you would go home today and read the 19th 
chapter of the book of Proverbs. Tomorrow you'll read the entire chapter 20. Do that every day of the month. And it's amazing if you do that. Uh, he, he was talking about how he had done that early in his life for five years. He did it consistent every day of every month for every year for five years. And boy, he knows the book of Proverbs. And, and it's amazing the wisdom that you gather from the book of Proverbs because it is from, like I said, the wisest. The Bible says here, Proverbs chapter 20, most men will proclaim. This is why we didn't hand out the most good-looking man, good-looking father on, on Father's Day right here. Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness. Yeah, okay. But, but a faithful man who can find? The just man walketh in his integrity. His children are blessed after him. Let's pray. Father, I ask now that you'd help us. You know what we stand in need of this day in this age in which we live. And I pray, oh, Father, that you'd speak to all of us today, not just fathers, but all of us today, that we would be your people in this day in which we live. Help us now. We'll praise you for all you do in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Proverbs, interesting, interesting book and a great, great book. I've read many, many stories, of course, about uh, ladies warning husbands. I've had different people call me and say, pray for my daughter. She's looking for a man. And I said, well, that's good. That's good. And uh, I encourage them, of course, try to, try, to, try to be the right person. I'll say some more about that in a few moments. I heard about the, the guy who was looking for a woman, and then, of course, the woman who was looking for a man. She would go out on her back deck every night, and she would look up in the stars and say, Lord, please send me a man. Lord, please send me a man. Lord, please send me a man. One night, there's a hoot owl out there. I said, hoo, hoo. She said, I don't care, Lord, just send me a man. <laughs> Well, of course, there's in desperation. Uh, many people are for the right kind of man. We need a revival of manhood in America, of course, and many people search for a man, but not just for a man, but for the right man. It's much different in our society now. Solomon expressed here in these brief words what a godly man ought to be. And I think the parallel, if you want to look for the parallel in the New Testament to this proverb, I think you could probably see it in Titus chapter number 2. Titus chapter number 2 lays a parallel to a godly man. I started to preach on that and look at that this morning, but I didn't. I just want to look at these two verses. Two verses. Most men will proclaim everyone his goodness. And when you stop and look at manhood in America, that's probably true, probably generally. I know we get around men, and men get around men. We got something to brag about. Amen, men? Y'all stay with me today. I'm preaching to all of us and preaching to me more than some of you ladies already. I see. Praise God. I'm glad you're with me. Help me now. Help you man. That's what we're here for, to help each other. And help me help you man and help us help each other. But we do. We, we have something to brag about, and thank God we do. Good self-esteem. But here in these two verses, the Word of God asks a question and it answers a question. You know in Proverbs chapter 31, this same Solomon writes and he says, Who can find a virtuous woman? And he uses the rest of that chapter to talk about what is a virtuous woman. And he talks about her, her price is far above rubies. And he goes into details. Well, he doesn't do that exactly here in Proverbs chapter number 20, but he does ask a question here. You notice it? A faithful man, who can find? A faithful man. Now, most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness. You ask a man what's good about you, he'd probably tell you something. At least something good about you. What's good about you, man? Uh, you'd probably tell me something, one thing you're good at. I hope. You better. Hey, man. I mean, your wife saw something good in you. I went in there and thanked mine this morning that God blinded her eyes for just a little while, that she could see something good in me uh, to pick me. Hey, man. You ought to thank your wife for that. Boy, I'm telling you, thank God he opened her heart to you. If you're a husband this morning and... You're a, uh, boy, I'm telling you, 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 you're blessed. 
And, and thank God that he give you a good woman. Thank God that you have a good wife. I, I'm telling you, who can find a faithful man? That's what I want to talk about this morning. Who can find a faithful man? That's what the Bible's asking here. Who can find a faithful man? And, and of course, Solomon answers that question, I believe, in these verses. As he talks about it in the profound truth of what he's writing here, if you stop and analyze it and look at it in detail, of what is being said here, I think you can find here in the scripture what Solomon is saying to us men and to all of us in general as godly people, what God wants in godly people. Boy, there's a need. There's a desperate need in our society today for godly people. I'm telling you, everywhere we look, we see ungodliness, don't we? You don't have to go very far to see ungodliness prevalent in our society. So we need godly people. I think Solomon asked this question. He answers this question. Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness. A faithful man, who can find, he asks. I want us to look at his description. The Bible talks about his description here. And it talks about what kind of man is a real faithful man. Or what kind of man is, is this faithful man. He is real. He says, first of all, I believe he is real. Look at the description. When you're looking for something, you, you always try to give a description of what you're looking for. Now, if you're searching for something, you're in market for something, they always want you to give some type of description of what you're looking for. If I were to ask you today, you men, you're in the market for a brand new truck. The first thing you would tell me probably is what kind of truck, what color, what you're looking for in that description, wouldn't you? You give out a description of what you're looking for and what you're looking for. And, and, and in that description, when a crime is committed, I go up to the Sheriff's Department, try to every week and uh, talk to those guys. And sometimes, you know, we have a, uh, something come in, a suspect or something come in. And the, uh, you're looking for somebody, and the first thing they want to do, of course, is ask. Ask. Sheriff's Department, Police Department's always ask for a description. How tall was this person? How heavy set? Uh, what's their ethnicity? Uh, what color of their skin? What were they wearing? Uh, what, 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 what was their makeup? All these things about them. And to give a description. If you're looking for something in particular, they need to know a description and search for them. If you want to know what a godly man looks like or a godly person, person looks like, you, you won't be looking in the wrong place. You look for the right things. You, you won't go to ESPN or uh, what is that, Q, Q something magazine. You, you won't go to Fortune 500. You won't go out in the world. If you want to know what a godly man looks like, if you want to know what a godly person looks like, you have to go to the pages of God's Word. If you want to know what God thinks of a godly person, you go to the Word of God. You see, to go the right place if you want to find the right description. And so God says here, the sincerity of this man, the sincerity of this man, he's real. The most, most men will proclaim. Most men will proclaim. But this guy's real. He, he, most men are proclaimed they're somebody or some it. Hello? We got a world full of actors, haven't we? We've got a world full of pretenders. But most men will proclaim his goodness. But when the rubber comes to where it hits the road, as the old saying is, when it comes down to the realness of things, this real man is a faithful man. He, he's the real stuff. Now when we talk about this sincerity, faithfulness, this is a faithful man. That, that word sincerity is found throughout the Bible and it literally cares where we get our word sincerity. literally cares with it the meaning of the old ancient times. Now in old ancient times they always used the pottery for about everything in their society. You know for the bowls, the artifacts, the vessels, vessels everything they used was made somewhat of a, a, a pottery substance. And, and many times those pottery makers would make a, a bowl or uh, some type of craft to hold something, water or some other other substance, and sometimes they would have a crack in them. And what they would literally do was fill that crack, a very minute crack, but it'd leak. That pot would leak. It wouldn't stand up at the right time. So what they would do is they would take wax and fill it up. Heat that thing up, put wax in that crack, let it cool off. And they'd heat that wax up and put it in that crack and let it cool off. And then they'd glaze that thing over and paint it up pretty and sell it to some unsuspicious person. 
That's where we get the word sincerity, literally in the picture form, I guess if you want to say it that way, is the literally he's not a waxed over guy. Now say it, down deep in his heart, he is far real. That means he's perfect now. It doesn't carry the fact that he's perfect, but that means that he will stand up. That pot, that hardware, that bowl, it, it would leak if it had a crack in it. But this man, this real godly, faithful man is without wax. In other words, he's sincere. He's not perfect. He's not without mistakes. But he's trying not to hide them. He's trying to be truthful with himself. He's not some facade. Now, we know what facade is. That's that big... Uh, city word for what we call putting on the dog, brother Corey. You know, uh, putting on the you, you know putting on the show. Huh? Uh, we, we 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 in the country we talk a little different than them city folks. They call it a facade. We call it putting on the show. Any man can talk. Any woman can fake it. But when it comes down to the real stuff, who are us? Who are we really? Really, a true man of God, a true woman of God. You, you don't examine ourselves sitting here among ourselves. We look pretty good this morning. But we examine ourselves when we're put to the test. That's where it really comes out. When we're put to the test. The sincerity, the realness of a person is, is only as good as when you test it. When you test it. You don't know till it's been tested, till it's been tried. Now, if you know a product that has been tested and tried, you don't have to test and try. You know it's going to hold up. It's already been tested and tried and it's been true to the form. But many people, you know, have not been tested. Here's the difference, of course, the difference between a hypocrite and a real man. A hypocrite is always putting on a pretending. He's pretending to be something that he's not. But a man is just someone who struggles. Maybe he struggles with sin. Maybe he struggles with trying to be the person that he ought to be in a daily, uh, trying to come up to what God wants him to do. That's a normal person. I say, and of course the Bible talks about it. You, you know what you call a man that tries to live for God and keeps falling short? You call him a man, a real man, a real woman who's striving to do what God wants him to do. And of course, a godly man, a godly woman is honest. They tell the truth with themselves, first of all, and then the world around them. I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. None of us are perfect. But he's sincere. He's sincere in what he does. Sincerely trying to Honor God with his life. But then not only is he sincere, that he's the real stuff, he is sacred. That, that is, he is a rarity. Hard to find. As a matter of fact, that's what he says here. Who can find? Who can find a faithful man? They're not a dime a dozen. I mean, they're not just run of the mill. And you won't find them just everywhere. A faithful man. There may be a stop sign on every street corner. There may be a Baptist church on every corner, but there's not a godly man on every corner. Who can find a faithful man, a godly man? These verses answer this question. They ask this question. They answer this question. Who can find a faithful man? He's talking about a faithful, godly man. By definition, of course, he's talking about it being a rarity. It's not something that's just going average, run-of-the-mill, typical man will not fit in this description. He's somebody that stands out. He's somebody that's different than the world. He's somebody that's faithful. He's somebody that God looks at. Can I just tell you, if you run with a crowd, you're not a godly person. The Bible talks about it. Any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I mean, seriously, you go with the, and agree with the culture around us, and it don't bother you. You better check up. You may not be a godly person. You, 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 you go along with everything that's put out there. If the most popular song's coming out of Nashville, you agree with and bop your head to and say it's okay. You're probably not lining up with this book. In our modern day society, hello, this ain't popular, but it's the truth. It's still the truth. And if we're not careful, we'll conform to those things. If you can tell the same jokes, use the same words, and have the same political and social views as the rest of the people around you at work in our modern-day society, you're probably not a godly person. You're not standing out. You're not different. God calls us to be different. God says this godly man, this godly, this faithful man is what? Who can find? He's a rarity. He's a rarity. Someone said, I don't want my kids to be weird. Have you noticed what's called normal today? Hello? 
Is that what you want? Ain't what I want for my grandkids. Ain't what I wanted for my kids either. It's the reason we unplugged them from the world. I don't want you being like the world. I'm telling you, it's amazing, ain't it? I used to tell my boys, I'm telling you, if there's a kind of man that's rare, you won't find him in that beer joint. You won't find him in that world of crowds. You won't find him. He, he's rare. He's not that run-the-mill that goes with everybody else and goes with the flow and does what everybody else does and just kind of fits in wherever he goes. He's a life of the party. No, 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 this is a rarity man. He's a real man. He's a sincere man. He's a rare man. You see what the Bible's saying here? I used to tell my boys, I'm telling you, you won't fit in. I used to tell them, if you want to find the perfect girl, and my boys did, Hallelujah. I couldn't, Karen and I talked about this for hours at time over the course of years. We couldn't have picked out better wives for our boys. If we'd have, if we'd have filled out a questionnaire and put them through a, 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 a two-week ordeal, Brother Ryan. I mean, we just couldn't have done it, Brother Tim. We couldn't have picked out better girls for them. Huh? God had it. God had it already in his hands. But I used to tell them, hey, if you want Miss Wright, you need to be Mr. Wright. Well, you tell them, get your life right, straighten up, do right, expect what you inspect, be what you want it to be, be what you expect it to be. Go, go looking in the wrong places. One of the saddest, probably one of the uh, most profound statements in the Word of God in the Bible, one of the verses is Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse number 30. I should have put it in the PowerPoint. It says this, listen to it. And I saw, this is God talking to Ezekiel now, sort of like the day in which we're living. I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it. Sound like America, don't it? And God says, but I found none. God's looking for godly people today. He's looking for a real man. He's looking for a sincere man. He's looking for a man that will stand. I wonder what the Lord would say if he looked over our congregation today. Now, as a pastor, I know what I would say. I look over this congregation. I see men and women here, and I say, hallelujah. There's some people that will stand for God. There's some people here that love God. There's some people here, there's a bunch of folks that are devoted to God. I'm telling you, they love God with all the hearts. Some children here, some teenagers here that love God and are devoted to God. They want to live for God. They have a desire to please God. Hallelujah. But I'm not the guy asking the question. God's asking the question. God said through his prophet, I sought for a man. I looked for a man. I was looking for someone who would be different from the world. Someone who would make up the hedge and stand in the gap. That I wouldn't destroy the land. I'm looking for somebody that will stand. Somebody that will make a difference. I tell you, the hope for America is not found in Washington. It's not found in Congress. It's not found in the Senate. It's not even found in our local realm today. I tell you where it's found. It's found right over there in your house when you get home. And it's found with that guy that looks in the mirror and that woman that looks in the mirror. That's where the hope of America is found. Godly people. That's the only hope. It's in us, you see. Someone that will stand. Someone who would intercede for the community. Somebody to get on their face before God for their family. And somebody to cry out to God and say, Oh, God, help me be a better man. Oh, God, help me be a better woman. Oh, God, help me to influence my children. Help me influence my, my, my grandchildren. Help me to be the person that I ought to be before a world around me. How can you reach somebody and make a difference in the world? Someone... It would make a difference that I should not destroy it. In the days of Ezekiel, God said, I found none. I was telling the Mountain Brotherhood this morning, Genesis 17, 18, Abraham interceded for his nephew Lot. You can go back and read the story. I won't take time this morning, but I believe that's the reason Lot was spared when Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. It's simply because he had a praying uncle. 
You will make a difference if you get on your face before God and pray. You're a righteous man. God calls him a, 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 he calls him a, a real man. He calls him a sincere man, a rare man. He calls him a steadfast. He calls him a faithful man. That's what the Bible calls him here in this verse. A faithful man that is steadfast. Look at this. He says he's steadfast. Verse number six. Most men will proclaim everyone in his own, his own goodness a faithful man. The Bible uses that term faithful man. Who can find that little, literally that word faithful there means uh, one who's trustworthy, one who's trusty. Trusty, not a trustee, but trusty with a Y. Trusty and one who is truthful. Oh my. One who's not afraid to tell the truth, not afraid to stand. Proverbs chapter 13, you'll find that same word, faithful. It talks about a messenger. One who will deliver a message for a king. Now in that day, they didn't have TV, they didn't have media, they didn't have Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, all that stuff that we have today. So when the king wanted his message delivered, he would send it with a person that he could trust that would relay his message to his people, his way, that they could understand it. Are you that kind of person? Oh, my. Oh, my. It's a person who would do, first of all, they do. They were willing to carry the message. Oh no, no, don't 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 call me. No, 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 I'm not you man. No, no, I'm not. Huh? Don't be a wimp. Step up. God help us to stand today. Oh man. Help us. I've told them before they've called on me for different things. I said, Well, if you you got somebody younger, that'd be good. I'll help them, I'll encourage them, I'll be here for them. They said, We don't know anybody younger preacher we'd rather have than you. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'm going to shirk away from it. Man, I'd rather train somebody else. But if you ain't got nobody else, I'll do it. I'll do it. I've already done my time, but I'll do it. I'm not ashamed to stand this day and time. Oh, we need to stand. Somebody who's do what they say they ought to do and do what they say they will do. The godly man, the person. You, you, you go to work. And you go to work when you say you're going to go to work. And you're there. And nobody has to worry. Nobody has to call and say, I wonder if he's where he says he's going to be. I wonder if he's doing what he's going to say he's going to do. They step up. They speak up. It's amazing what would happen if we see God's people just do that. those two things. Step up and speak up. In a world and age which we see, can you be counted on? Can you be counted on to step up, to do something, to do it, to do what God wants us to do? The man of God is steadfast. He's loyal. He's dependable. He can be counted on. He's accountable to God and his family, to his church family. He's, he's not faithful if. We got a bunch of these today. I'm not picking on anybody. I'm just picking on me. Because I've been here too. Not faithful if. Well, I, I, you know, I, if I can make it, I'll make it. No, no, no. He's faithful. I'll be there. You need me there, I'll be there. Somebody needs to stand? Yeah, I'll do it. He's faithful, unconditional. That faithful person. He's faithful, period. He's committed to his wife till death do us part. Not afraid to step up. Not afraid to stand up for her because his love is real to her. Hello? Quiet, boy, if we had a corpse, we could have a nice funeral this morning. Gets quiet, don't it? Boy, it hurts, don't it? Sometimes it does. He's not committed to his children as long as they behave. Oh, my. I look at my wife because we've got this ongoing joke with our boys. When our boys were great, doing everything they're supposed to do, they're my boys. When they mess up, Karen, you need to do something about your boys. They were her boys. Y'all have that in y'all's home? Yeah, we used to do that too, yeah. His boys, my boys, her boys. In reality, of course, it's not that way. He, he has taken up the task of raising them, nurturing them in the admonition of the Lord. And this man is not committed to God's house as long as it's not deer season or as long as it's not golf time or as long as it's not Super Bowl Sunday or as long as it's not, oh me, it's getting quiet now. Until we've turned the channel off now, haven't we? Huh? Oh, we're committed. We're committed. 
Let me just ask you this question. We'll move on, okay? How else are you going to convey to your family, your children, that God comes first in your life if you don't make the house of God a priority in your life? How else are you going to do it? Well, God's first in my life, but we can go to Lake on Sunday. We can go to wherever on this Sunday, and then we can go there somewhere else on this Sunday. And, but God's still first in my life. You know God's first in my life. How are you going to prove it to your children? We go everywhere else on Sunday, do everything else on Sunday. How are you going to prove it to your children that God is a priority in my life? I put God first in my life. His house comes first. His worship comes first. His work comes first. He is first. How else are you going to prove it? You tell me. You say in the life I live. Well, the life you live is committed to God as a priority in his house and to his people. Like he's asked us to do in his word. Oh, me. Proverbs 20, verse 7. The just man walketh in his integrity. That word just means he's been saved. That's how you're going to do it. You've got to have a changed heart. A lot of people ain't committed because they don't have a right change, a right heart. See, God changed my heart. I'm committed. I, I just tell you, boy, when we wasn't having Sunday night service. He convicted me. Sometimes I'd go other places. It's okay. I understood why we wasn't. I understood that. I, I didn't have a problem here. I didn't. I told him I wanted it to be different when we come back, and I think we're doing some great stuff on Sunday night now. I really do, and I'm proud of it. Hallelujah. But the worship of God in our lives, how the house do we pro used to promote that with my boys? You gotta put God first in your life. How else are you gonna prove to the world, prove to yourself that God is first? If you don't make him a priority. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generation. Noah walked with God. He was righteous. The Bible talks about Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 15, Abraham believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness, the Bible says. Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse number 6. Understand, therefore, that the Lord thy God giveth thee not this good land to possess it for thy righteousness, but for Thou art, uh, for thou art a stiff-necked people. He give it to them because of his righteousness. God puts his righteousness in us. All of our righteousness is an un unclean thing, the Bible says. O oh Lord, righteousness belongeth to thee. How are we going to be righteous? We get it from God. We get it from putting him first. We get it from make him making a change in our heart and our life. Here's the second thing. You look at his deeds. The just man walketh in his integrity. You see it in his deeds. What's he doing? Right off the bat, you need to notice the text does not say, it does not mention his salary. It doesn't mention what kind of person he is, what kind of truck he drives. It doesn't mention how much weight he press. It doesn't mention all those things. It talks about his daily conduct. It talks about who he is. It doesn't mention his bank account, his holdings, his job title. It doesn't mention his career position. Why? Because God, God takes care of all that, and he's looking for something from his heart. The just man walketh in his integrity. What a word, integrity. Hey, look at his conduct. He walketh. Look at his conduct here. The Bible talks about he walketh in his integrity. Men and women alike, of course, are cursed with the ability to talk by the mile and live by the inch. Hmm. Verse number six, he says, many a man. Many a man proclaims, but do we live it? Talk is cheap. Actions speak louder than words. We've heard it all of our life. A new church bought an abandoned building. It's a pool hall. They were going to start having church. And the owner, of course, transitioned out of it, and he turned it over to them. And they said, we'll just move the pool, uh, all the pool stuff out. We'll just start having worship here. Well, they had a parrot over in the corner. Had all the alcohol stuff over there. They shut it all down. Had the parrot on the corner, and the guy said, oh, you can keep that old bird. I ain't caring about that bird no way. Finally, the church moved in, renovated, took all that stuff out. <laughs> and the parrot was a talker. He said, new owner, new owner. People started coming in. They started playing different music. He said, new band, new band. People started coming in to worship. He said, same crowd, same crowd. <laughs> oh, me. Jesus said it this way. Can I say it to us this way? Hurts me. 
Why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? That convicts me at least once a week. God said that to me. You call me Lord. Am I really Lord? He said, I know him, and he keepeth and keepeth. He that says, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar. John said in 1 John chapter 2. Truth's not in him. Look at his, not only his conduct, but look at his consistency. The Bible talks about it here in these words. His consistency, his integrity. He's took on that word integrity to where it becomes his. It's something he's possessing. It's something that's important to him how he appears to everybody else. You see, I'm representing somebody bigger than me, God. I'm representing God, his integrity. Oh, you see, the godly man imparts his life everywhere he goes. Did you hear that? The godly man imparts his life everywhere he goes. It ought to be when you walk in, they say, Whoa, oh, hush now, there's a preacher. Even though you're not a preacher, that's what to say when I walk in. I said, God's still listening. He was listening before I ever showed up. That's what I say and smile. Huh? Just a reminder. But it ought to be you have an impact on somebody's life. To where they see godliness in you. You see, his integrity, he's different. He won't go along with that. People say, on the job, oh no, he won't go along with that. He's, he's complete. It's literally what that word integrity carries with it. He talks about he's complete. In other words, he's the whole package. In other words, everywhere he goes, he's the same. He's the same. Now, I cut up and carry on a lot. Sure did. I had a good time with them Alvin boys yesterday. I was carrying on with me and Arlen was about trying to beat them in that cornhole yesterday at our picnic. We had a good time. I get out there on the ball field with my grandchildren, you know, and sometime that umpire make a call, you know. I said, I've seen better eyes on potatoes, man. Come on. What I said, somebody look over and say, preacher say that? I say, hey, it's all in fun. I've talked to them umpires before and told them, hey, it's okay. It's part of the game, ain't it? Or is it? If you've never had an argument with a our disagreement with the call, showing support for your team, I guess. Now, some of them, hey, if they're real bad calls, you, you see me, I just get up and walk off, man. I ain't going to argue because I'll get myself in that, and I'm not going to get the flesh in that. I'm going to have a good time. Hello? Know where to draw the line. Have a good time. Consistency. You see, he's the whole man. He's the, he's the real guy. He's the same in here as he is out yonder. He could talk about the same conversation. And he would use the same words. Oh, man. His description, he's a trustworthy, righteous man. His deeds, he walks in integrity. Here's the last thing I'm done. His descendants, this is the most important, ain't it? His children are blessed after him, the Bible says. Verse number 7, he talks about his descendants. The just man walketh in his integrity. He's been saved. He's been changed by the marvelous grace of God. Have you, have you experienced that? The change in your heart? You, you see, without righteousness, you won't, you won't never make it to heaven. You won't be able to do these things. It takes God living in us. But his descendants, his children are blessed. I, I, I think one of the... One of the most important things in our lives, every one of us would agree, is we want our children to be blessed. We want our children to have it better. Now that interpretation of the word better sometimes gets, gets confused. I don't, I'm not going to preach on parental class this morning. I'm not going there, but really, sometimes I think I need to take some of them aside and say, you're not helping your child by giving him everything. He needs to earn it. But, but we won't go there. But, but they'll never know the value of it if you don't teach them how to earn it. It's true. But, but the little boy was crying on his way home because the preacher said, every child needs godly parents. He got in the car and he was crying. They said, what's wrong? He said, <laughs> Children's Church, they told me every child needs God with parents. He said, I want to stay with y'all. <laughs> oh, me. The biblical success. His children are blessed. That's one of the greatest things. You, you think about that financially. We want to bless our children financially. There's some parents today that have been caught, taken out, credit cards in their children's name, running them ahead of time. 
I think sometimes we do that spiritually when we don't allow them to grow spiritually, earn what it takes to become successful spiritually, learning the things of God, learning to walk by faith with God. There's so much I could say there. I mean, one of the best ways you can bless your children is by living a godly life and they hear it and they see it, not on Sunday, but every day of your life. It's not a question whether or not we're going to say the blessing before we eat. It's not a question when something questionable comes up on that tube, on that screen. It's not a question. They, they know we're going to have to turn that off. Watch well, junk. Blessed is the man, I taught my boys this, this Psalm chapter 1. You ought to write that down and teach it to your children. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the God, and there standeth in the way of sinners, and there sitteth in the seat of the scarful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Hallelujah. The ungodly are not so. I can go and quote the rest of it to you, but I've taught them to learn that by heart. You got to know that in your heart. At least be able to say it. I don't know if it ever got. I think it got in their heart. I kept pounding on them so long. Here's the last thing, the very last point: the blessed succession. You see it? Did you see it? It's that word after. You missed that, didn't you? I did. First time I read it, I missed it. I kept looking a little deeper, Tim Earl, and I found it right there. His children are blessed after him. After. That's the greatest tribute any man could have. To know that his children and his grandchildren are going to be blessed by God. Why? Because they're, number one, they're blessable. Oh, my. You can pray all you want to. If your children are living in sin, boy, God's going to have to deal with it sooner or later. And God will deal with it sooner or later. I've had my children in sin and know it. And I prayed, oh God, please be merciful. Please deal with their heart. Please bring them back soft as you can. But Lord, if that don't work, you know what you got to do. What I used to do as a parent, as bad as I hated it. Come here, son. We got to talk about what you've done. There's a consequence to what you've done. Sometime I'd have to take the old belt off. I know nobody likes to hear that. Oh, boy, you're a wicked parent. Well, you call me whatever you want to. I think my boys are pretty successful. Succession. Succession. Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Stephen Covey wrote that book many, many years ago. He said you start with the end in view. With the end in view. Know where you're going to end up. And you work toward that. After. You see that? Until after. After. He's a believer that's got enough sense to look down the road until after the decisions are made. He, he don't jump. He thinks about the consequences of the blessing. He thinks about the consequences of letting the decisions run their course. He thinks about what's going to happen after I make this decision. Not just now, but after. After. After you've left them alone in the room. Who are they? After, you, after they graduate from school, who are they? After... after they're away in college. Who are they? After you've walked down the aisle and turned them loose with someone else for their partner in life, who are they? You won't be able to hold their hand all their life. I started young with my boys teaching them, you're going to have to walk with God. He's going to have to be your convictor. He's going to have to be the one that leads you and guides you and directs you. After, after you brought grandkids into this world, after they carried you your old age and cared for you. And after they carry me to the cemetery and plant me somewhere, who will they be then? My greatest desire is that they be godly. That God can still bless them. A godly person. A faithful man who can find. God help us to be faithful people. Let's stand for prayer. And Father, I want to thank you for stirring my heart with this, your word. Solomon, wise man, he learned sometimes the hard way of these things. But, Lord, he put them in your holy book that is for eternally sealed. And a reminder for us today that we can be godly people, even in this day and age which we're living. Help us to be your people. 
Lord, I pray if there's one among us that's never trusted you as personal Savior, they, they can't live for you because they don't know you as a real relationship, but Lord, you want them to. Then there's others that are striving to maybe try to make a difference, trying to live for you, but Lord, they're just not wholly committed, realizing, Lord, this morning they just need to surrender all to you, give it all to you, to be the person you want them to be, to be real. Help us, Lord, to do business with you in this invitation time. In Jesus' wonderful name I pray. Amen. We're singing. Will you do that today? Will you trust him and obey? Will you? Come on.